Hi viewers, um, it's Anthony Picton here from Vitalab in, in Santon and uh, we're going to be talking today about endometriosis. So, so the first question really is what is endometriosis and it basically boils down to you have tissue which is identical to the inside of the uterus which is somewhere else in your body and most often this is inside the pelvis so whatever happens normally within the uterus is happening elsewhere so this monthly menstrual cycle which women are experiencing as the menstrual cycle is turning into monthly bleeding in ectopic sites which can be either in the pelvis or in some cases in the belly button or even in the nose or as uh, exotic as somewhere like the brain so what are the signs or symptoms of endometriosis well as you can imagine if these areas are responding monthly to the hormonal changes very often these symptoms tend to exacerbate monthly and any bleeding in the abdomen causes pain. So the most common symptom will be cyclical exacerbation of pain, so menstrual pain. And over time, this may lead to chronic pelvic pain, which doesn't uh, subside between menstrual cycles. And then, as we mentioned, the more exotic sites can sometimes lead to monthly bleeding from places like, for instance, the navel or from the nose or even within the lung or even worse in the brain. So those are very few and far between, but they'll probably be the only ones that people remember, right? Um, and then of course, some of the other symptoms will be related to the response of the body to this inflammation. And very often the body tries to compartmentalize uh, a situation where it thinks there's inflammation. So it's trying to wall off infection or wall off inflammation, and it does so by forming adhesions. And adhesions basically stick pieces of bowel over the, the sick area. And uh, in an attempt to save itself, the body actually damages itself because this response uh, leads to adhesions around the fallopian tubes and adhesions around the ovaries. And this can lead to infertility. How do we, how do we diagnose endometriosis? The gold standard is to find it and biopsy it. And this is often done with a laparoscopy. Uh, or, and so laparoscopy would be the gold standard it can be seen on ultrasound but one must remember that there are different stages of endometriosis which are unrelated to the symptoms and the early stages are not visible on ultrasound so that's not a reliable means of diagnosing endometriosis so where can endometriosis occur in the body we've said anywhere in the pelvic uh, cavity or in the abdominal pelvic cavity so uh, all the pelvic organs can be affected including the bowel including the bladder the uterus, the fallopian tubes, the ovaries. And then ectopic sites would be outside of the abdominal cavity. And the thought is that they can be disseminated anywhere in the body uh, through hematogenous dissemination, in other words, through the bloodstream. So anywhere the blood is, eventually endometriosis can get to. What are endometriomas? So endometriomas are the one visible form of endometriosis that we can see on the ultrasound readily. And it's basically, we call it a chocolate cyst uh, for want of a much better description. And it means that there is trapped menstrual fluid within, a, within an area in the ovary. And that endometriosis monthly will grow and bleed into that trapped space and over time will accumulate. And this gives the characteristic chocolate cyst appearance, at, certainly at laparoscopy and also on ultrasound. So how does endometriosis impact fertility? And I think we need to look at, at two things really. We need to look at how it impacts fertility directly in terms of tubal function, in terms of the picking up of the egg from, from the ovary during ovulation, and also how it affects the ovarian reserve. In other words, the long-term ovarian function. And uh, endometriosis impacts all of these negatively. We mentioned earlier that you can get adhesions, which is a response of the body to inflammation. And these adhesions will basically stick closed the ends of the fallopian tubes. So you can end up with blocked tubes or tubal factor infertility. They can also prevent the tubes picking up the egg. In, so the, the uh, egg retrieval mechanism it has been negatively impacted. This can lead to not only infertility, but a higher chance of ectopic pregnancy. And then of course, endometriosis can actually uh, affect your ovarian reserve. So when diagnosed with, with 
endometriosis, you have to ask yourself, what is my AMH, my anti-malarian hormone level? How much petrol do I have left in the tank of my ovary? Because if my desire is to have more than one child, and if my desire is to postpone my fertility, do I have that luxury or do I need to make provision for that by freezing eggs? What treatments are available for endometriosis? So there are symptom relieving mechanisms which are largely fall to, to medicines. And then there is surgery. Uh, I think it's important to realize that endometriosis is a chronic inflammatory condition once established and it tends to be progressive. So when we look at surgery, by its nature, surgery has to be aggressive towards the disease, but has to be conservative towards the organ function. So if you were looking for the ultimate cure for endometriosis, never having, having it again, or having a chance of having it again, you would remove the woman's uterus, her ovaries, the fallopian tubes, and all the visible endometriosis, and you would leave her without any symptoms and with a very minimal chance of any recurrence. Of course, if she wants to have children, this is at loggerheads with anything she wants to achieve. So from the outset, surgery is compromised because most of the patients going for endometriosis surgery say, look, I still want to have a family. So please leave my uterus, please leave my ovaries and my fallopian tubes. And if they're diseased, respect their function and perhaps leave some disease on them because at least I still have the function of those organs. So it's a compromised outcome. So that's why we see up to 60% of patients who have endometriosis surgery have recurrent symptoms later. And so it doesn't provide a long-term cure for a lot of patients. All of the medical treatments looking at improving the symptoms are based on the fact that they're reducing menstrual flow. So anything that reduces your menstrual flow in terms of, of your cycle from the uterus will also reduce the growth of endometrial deposits elsewhere in your body. So things like the oral contraceptive pill, um, the progesterone only tablets uh, and certain tablets that are designed specifically to treat endometriosis at, are designed to reduce endometrial proliferation. So they, they reduce the growth of those endometrial deposits, they reduce menstrual flow in terms of the, uh, the normal menstrual cycle and then as a result of that decreased bleeding elsewhere in the abdomen, they will uh, obviously reduce the pain experienced. So, can multiple surgeries for endometriosis have an impact on fertility? And this is very important. I've personally seen a patient referred to us with no ovaries visible on ultrasound after her seventh laparoscopy. And, you know, at some point an alarm bell has to come on if you're going for multiple surgeries for the same pathology. And I think from a patient's point of view, you just want the problem to go away. But I think you, you need to read up about your condition and you need to be as informed as possible. The biggest concern we have is every surgery, there's a potential for damage and adhesion formation. So when I say damage, often endometriosis affects the ovary. And we've already said that endometriosis per se can affect your, your ovarian reserve. In other words, the petrol in the tank of the ovary is already reduced you haven't got a family yet, and now you go for surgery, presumably to improve your symptoms, and the surgery itself, by the removal of endometriomas or by the um, ablation of endometriosis on the ovary, leads to damage of the surrounding normal tissue. And it's impossible to predict how much normal tissue will be damaged during these procedures. But we know if you measure the AMH before a procedure and you measure it immediately afterwards and even six months later, very often you see a reduction in the AMH or what we would term the ovarian reserve. So this woman who already had a compromised ability to perhaps respond to ovarian stimulation is either could possibly be further compromised. And I think it's important to discuss that beforehand with your doctor and say, where am I currently? Should I maybe freeze some eggs or put away some eggs, make provision for my, my future fertility before we address the endometriosis? Or do you think it's safe for me to go ahead with this procedure without uh, addressing that? Is there a cure for endometriosis? And sadly, the answer is probably no. I think if we had a cure already, uh, we would know all about it. It would certainly be uh, hotter than the, uh, all the vaccines. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the reason for this is we've got two things. We've got recurrent disease and we've got uh, residual disease. So when you're operated, like I've mentioned already, 
it's always a compromise between being as aggressive as you can towards the endometriosis and as conservative as possible towards the pelvic organs. So these two are at loggerheads with one another. You can't remove every single organ that is affected by this completely and leave the patient uh, satisfied because they need a lot of the organs that have been involved. So from the beginning, you leave disease there. And even if they are small deposits, they will grow over time. Secondly, if women are still of reproductive age, going through cyclical hormonal change, there's the potential to develop new endometriosis over time. So what we tend to see is that patients, whether they're operated or placed on medication, tend to have a slow recurrence of their symptoms over years. Some are lucky and they may have a period of many years between requiring laparoscopy or surgery for, for unmanageable pain. Others aren't so fortunate and uh, they may find that their symptoms recur even within six months. So, so no, there's not really a cure per se. So what is my advice for you watching this who've been diagnosed with endometriosis? I think importantly, you need to know how endometriosis can impact your fertility. And, and the most important message is, how has it impacted my ovarian reserve? Where am I in terms of my anti-malarian hormone, my AMH? If you've had a discussion about endometriosis, it really needs to go together with a discussion about your ovarian reserve, your AMH. So you need to be asking that question if it hasn't been discussed already. I think another important thing is to realize that many women with endometriosis will present with infertility. Very few of them will, as a result of surgery, end up being fertile. So this is a big take home message. Having a laparoscopy will improve your pain symptoms, but won't necessarily improve your tubal function or your ovarian function to a point where you will have a spontaneous conception. So there needs to be an open discussion beforehand to say, look, my concerns are one, my quality of life, the amount of pain I'm experiencing is unacceptable. I want this to improve, but I don't want this to improve at the cost of my future fertility. And I want to preserve what fertility I have. Can we do this together or do we do it sequentially? And if we're going to do it sequentially, do I need to address egg reserve before and put away eggs in cryopreservation, preserve my fertility and then go for the surgery or will it not make a difference? And um, so I think those are the take home messages. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, if you like it, like it. And uh, if you want to subscribe to our channel, please do. We look forward to uh, posting some more exciting information about endometriosis in the, in the near future. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.